Okay, uh, let's get uh, started with the Scilab Distinguished Seminar for this week. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Scott from uh, Arbor Networks. So uh, Scott is the Senior Product Manager for uh, Distributed Denial of Service or DDoS products at Arbor. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure many of you in the room know about Arbor, but the, for those of you who don't, uh, Arbor Networks is one of the leading anti-DDoS uh, vendors on the market today. Uh, Arbor products are deployed in over 107 countries, almost all sort of tier one ISPs, so these are the AT&Ts, Deutsche Telekoms of the world, uh, deploy uh, Arbor products and more than 70% of tier two ISPs like Comcast, Verizon deploy Arbor products as well. Uh, so Arbor is in sort of this unique vantage point where they see almost like 60 terabit per second of traffic uh, on, on, a, on, on, a, on a daily, daily basis, uh, which gives them like a unique perspective into what's happening in the real world in terms of attacks, and especially with respect to uh, DDoS attacks. Uh, so hopefully sort of Scott's, Scott's going to enlighten us on like what they actually see in, in the real world. Uh, Scott actually designed and helped design and implement one of the core components of Arbor's uh, system, uh, something called PeakFlow, uh, which is one of their systems for getting visibility uh, into network traffic. And if you have actually worked at an ISP or talked to any of the network operators, one of the biggest problems is they actually don't know what the hell is going on. So, uh, and that's actually a big problem. The lack of visibility is a big problem. Uh, and sort of PeakFlow is one of the sort of systems that actually gives uh, the visibility in a network-wide context to uh, the operators. Uh, Scott actually received his PhD uh, from uh, the University of Michigan in 2001, uh, where he was advised by our provost, Farnam uh, Jahanian. And since then, I think he's been at Arbor, uh, and now he's actually leading uh, sort of the product and business strategy teams for uh, DDoS defense at Arbor. Uh, he has numerous papers and patents. If I go through them, uh, we, we actually won't get to the talk. So I'll, I'll hand off to Arbor, uh, hand off to uh, Scott. One thing, though, actually, I should mention that Scott actually has a Pittsburgh connection. He grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, which I accidentally found out in a hangout conversation I had with him. Uh, so uh, over before, so one logistical note: if you're asking a question, uh, please press the little black button so the people on the audio conference can actually hear your question. Uh, so without with that, let me hand over to Scott. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Vyas. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. And this is a great turnout. I, I hope I uh, give you a talk that's worth coming to. But at least you got free lunch out of it. So. That's good. Um, so <clears throat> I'm Scott Eichel Johnson. I want to walk you through a few things today. And I do talk quickly, because uh, I did grow up here. So uh, Jens know what I'm talking about. Um, but if I uh, am going too fast, feel free to raise your hand and ask me to repeat something or slow down. So a few things I'd like to cover, and I'm just going to come out from behind the podium. I hate standing behind podiums to talk. Uh, so I want to talk just very briefly about who is Arbor, although actually Vyas already uh, did a good job of that. So that won't take as much time now. Uh, talk a little bit about an operational network overview. What does a real network look like? And therefore, what does that mean about how we have to approach solving security problems for those networks? Uh, from there, we'll get into the, the real meat of the DDoS uh, topic. What are the DDoS security best practices uh, that we see and we've helped develop for networks? Uh, and then I'll present some results from our recent uh, paper. This is an annual report we do every year called the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report. It's based on a survey of hundreds of ISPs, large enterprises, uh, governments, uh, you name it. And it provides a really comprehensive view of what's actually happening with respect to DDoS around the world. And then in close, we'll do a deeper dive into a particular DDoS uh, campaign. And this is a TAC campaign uh, that actually some folks at CMU have even written about in some of your papers, the, the DD4BC or the DDoS for Bitcoin extortion campaign. Uh, so I'll give you our perspective on that. Uh, so hopefully, uh, uh, we can definitely keep this informal. So if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and I'm happy to answer anything as, as it comes up. Oop, I lost my pointer. All right, what's going on here? <clears throat> All right, we'll see if I can get this working. Uh, so who is Arbor? Uh, yes, uh, kind of uh, laid it out, but basically we are the largest DDoS protection uh, vendor in the world. Um, over 50% market penetration overall, uh, something like slightly over 70% of the world's tier Two ISPs use us, so even the regional ones, and we we have all of the tier ones now. Um, as of last year, the last holdout, uh, cheap bastards had had signed on. Um, so uh, so it's been a really good experience, uh, just getting to know. You know, coming from an academic background where we didn't really have any way to know what happens in real networks, now getting to see the opposite side of that, working closely with all these service providers to understand that. Um, so Arbor was a uh, you know startup that came out of the University of Michigan uh, with Farnham. So. So 
uh, you know, it, it was very interesting to see that transition from the university environment to the, the research and industry environment. And it is a great chance to take ideas and put them into practice, and we've really enjoyed that. You know, we've protected the Olympics. We've done every Olympics since 2001. Uh, we've protected uh, World Cups. We've, we've protected all kinds of major events around the world, um, as well as just working with folks, you know, DARPA, Google, and others. Um, Google has, did a great project last year called the Google Attack Map uh, that comes from our live DDoS data that's coming from our, streaming from our deployments around the world and our various customers. So you can Google up, Google the Google Attack Map and, and you'll find it. It's very interesting. Um, so uh, lots of interesting things going on. So uh, with that said, let's talk a little bit then about uh, what an operational network looks like. And I apologize if this is review for a lot of you, um, uh, but I just want to make sure we're all kind of defining our terms together, starting from the same place. So when you talk about a, a real service provider network, and even enterprise networks, if it's a large enterprise, can end up looking like this. You know, you typically have some type of peering or transit edge, and uh, that may be free peering if you're a really large ISP. It may be paid transit or paid upstream connectivity for a smaller ISP, but there's some points of presence, points where you exchange traffic with other networks. You have your backbone, and the backbone connects that peering edge to the things that actually make you money, which is your data center and any services hosted there or services run out of there, and of course your other customers if you're an ISP, whether that's business customers, broadband, other ISPs, in the case of a large, you know, like a tier one provider. Uh, and pretty much it could be any, some of mix of anything. And this is the, the logical view that we have and think about conceptually when we are thinking about how to approach and deploy in, in a large network. So traffic moving from the peering edge through the data center, the customer edge in between all of these. Now this is a really pretty simple, easy to understand picture. Obviously, the reality is going to be a lot messier than that. In reality, you know, a peering link, a customer-facing link, a data center link, all of these can be present on the exact same router. So this is a logical view. It's not meant to be an actual physical map of the network. And in reality, and the physicality of it is that the backbone is surrounded by an edge of routers that is incorporating all customer, data center, and peering traffic all in the same places based on geography based on the physical connectivity where it plugs into other things and a backbone that connects them so they can all talk to each other. So that makes it, can make it a lot more messy in real life. Now, we have this network. How are we going to secure it? How are we going to monitor it? How are we going to understand what's happening on that network? So we're going to deploy some monitoring infrastructure. We'll talk about how we collect that data and how we make use of it in a couple of slides. But <clears throat> at least the way Arbor approaches the problem is we deploy these collectors, as we call them, around the network. And they can be physically distributed around the network, or they could be centralized, and all the data gets backhauled to that data center where they live. People do it both ways. Uh, they both work just as well. Uh, but this will give us, as we'll show you, visibility into exactly what's happening around the network, which is useful both from a, a network engineering perspective, so I can see how traffic is flowing, how traffic patterns are changing, where am I going to run out of capacity, uh, where am I having bad service, uh, and so on. But then that also answers a lot of security questions. Is there a DDoS attack going on? Uh, what other types of malicious activity might there be around the network that we want to deal with? Although my focus today is going to be on DDoS. So in addition to that monitoring infrastructure, we also have uh, what we often call a scrubbing center. So you can think, think of this as a data center. In practice, this will actually be inside of the data center. But this is where you have your security infrastructure that actually cleans the traffic. So when a DDoS attack happens, um, there are cases, as we'll talk about, where you can just block it at the edge of your network by installing ACLs on your routers or doing a BHP flow spec announcement or other things like that. But in a lot of cases, especially for more sophisticated attacks, uh, application layer attacks, other things, you actually need to take the traffic in somewhere, look at it, inspect it, block all the bad stuff and let the good stuff through. And that happens inside the scrubbing center. Why a scrubbing center? Well, we could actually have this same protection running in line all around the network. It would work just as well. The problem is scale and cost. Scale and cost of doing that, there are service providers that do do that. I can mention a couple of large online retailers that do that because connectivity is so valuable to them. Every dropped session is a lost sale to them. So there it does make commercial sense to have something more in line all the way around the network. But for most networks, especially ISPs, this is the model you have because you can have concentrated resources, oversubscribe them the same way we do circuits, and so on. And so now when attacks come into the network, 
Um, and I show them here coming in through the peering edge, which is typically how you think about them. But in reality, these attacks could just as easily be coming into the network from the customers or from the data center. Um, the Operation Ababalu attacks of three years ago came from infected servers running old versions of PHP living in data centers around the world. So that's where the attack, and those attacks actually came out of those data centers, left the network to go attack someone else, but in so doing, they caused problems for the source networks as well, even though they weren't the target of the attack. So we have attacks come in. At some point, that traffic then gets routed to the scrubbing center, and the scrubbing center does its job, and the clean traffic then goes on to the customer. Uh, this at a very high 30,000 foot view level is, is what we're about, at least when it comes to DDoS. So all of this hinges on how do we actually monitor and instrument that network. There are a couple of ways that we do this. The first is, is NetFlow. And so for those of you that don't know, NetFlow is now a, a ubiquitously deployed technology. It's great. If NetFlow didn't exist, Arbor wouldn't exist. This is what we built the company on. Uh, and what NetFlow does is all of the routers will, on a, a statistically sampled basis, usually about one out of every thousand packets, take the information in that packet and update it in a cache somewhere, and then periodically send the records from that cache out to whoever wants to receive them. And so this information will contain byte and packet counts on a flow-by-flow -flow basis for what's happening in the network. So you get all of the layer three and layer four information from the packets that were sampled, and you can then make statistical, uh, uh, not guesses, but statistical measurements about what's happening. And one in a thousand sounds like a really low uh, sample rate, and for the first, I would say, you know, eight, nine years of Arbor, we had to constantly convince people that this is actually gonna give you accurate measurements. Now people, I think, have largely realized that and have accepted it, but it was a long uphill climb to do that. And the reason is really just the law of large numbers. Yes, it's one out of every thousand packets, but your population of packets is so massively gigantic. It's just billions and billions and billions of packets every minute that even one in a thousand can give you an extremely accurate picture of what you're seeing everywhere. Yeah, yes, if what you care about is one individual TCP session between two end hosts, you're probably not gonna catch that. But for anything that matters to an operational network, especially when it comes to DDoS, which by definition has a volumetric nature to the traffic, very easy to detect things with this. There is actually uh, some possibility of getting application level data here as well, although it's less commonly deployed. That's typically gonna come from service routers inside the data center. The other way we do this is via routing information. So all of our monitoring infrastructure are also BGP peers. So we beach peer here with all the routers. We act as a full peer, we get all of their routes. We actually have them configured as a route reflector so we see everything. And that gives us a complete view into the routing table. Our focus is on BGP. There have been other companies that have done this through IGPs like OSPF or ISIS. Much less interesting to me because we care much less about how traffic is being routed inside the backbone as we do about where it's coming from and where it's going to the broader internet. That tells us much more interesting things like I have a DDoS attack coming in. Well, hey, it's coming from you know, Korea or Brazil or wherever. Maybe I don't actually care about traffic from Brazil. I'm just gonna block Brazil and take care of the DDoS attack and I don't even have to worry about what kind of traffic it is, right? So there's a lot of interesting things there. Also from a business standpoint, you know, what markets is my traffic coming from? That's also very interesting. I can tell you that uh, you know, very timely, yesterday was the Super Bowl. I know there's a couple of large hosting companies that use this data from our system to measure the impacts of their Super Bowl commercials in different Super Bowl markets because they can see where the traffic is coming from at what time. Then you get even more value by taking this routing, taking this NetFlow and correlating them together. So now every time we get a flow record, the flow record itself doesn't tell us anything about where it came from, where it's going. All we have is the IP address. But because we have the routing table, now we know the path the traffic followed uh, to get wh for where it's going, and we can infer the path it followed to get to us, although with asymmetric routing, that may not always be accurate. But we know the origin AS, we, know, we can know the origin, uh, the, the other paths, we know the destination of where it's going, so very useful to have those two. And then lastly, SNMP. And of course, SNMP is the granddaddy of, of monitoring, and really, uh, it doesn't provide that much useful information unless you're the, the low-level engineer that cares about whether a link is saturated right now or not. Um, but it is also useful as a sanity check on these other two. You know, with SNMP, I can say, okay, is my NetFlow giving me accurate data? And that's the most common way we see it used now is if once you have NetFlow, you don't really need SNMP anymore except you want to make sure your NetFlow is accurate. And there's lots of reasons why it can be inaccurate, which we don't have time to go into. But SNMP helps provide an alternate measurement methodology where you can sanity check the accuracy of your primary data source.
So that's very useful. So that's what all those collectors that are out there in the network are doing. And so we have deployments that are doing this for upwards of 2,000 routers across a large tier one backbone. And it's very scalable and very efficient to do it this way. So that's kind of the what. That's how we get into the network. That's how we can actually start thinking about solving or defending against DDoS attacks for that network, for that network's customers. How do we actually then go about doing that? Well, first, just taking a step back, you know, DDoS is a security problem. And when you think about security, there's really three things that, that you care about. Uh, the first one that a lot of people think about is integrity, data integrity. You don't want someone to manipulate your data, change it. Confidentiality, that's actually the most common one. You don't want someone to steal your data. So every time someone goes into Target or some other retailer, pulls out a bunch of credit card accounts, you've lost confidentiality. But the third is availability. And people often don't think about availability as a security problem. They think about it as an engineering problem. But really, it's a security problem, too, because the whole purpose of DDoS attacks is to attack availability. And that's why it's a security problem. So when you're talking about DDoS defense, your goal is actually to make sure that the service you're protecting is available even when it's under DDoS attack. So you're not necessarily worried about confidentiality or integrity at this point. There's all kinds of other security tools and security solutions for those problems, which fall more under the advanced threat space, what we now call advanced threat, although that's a pretty recent term. So DDoS is really about availability. And you're thinking about how to make sure the service is available. And that may lead you to do things that you wouldn't do if you weren't under attack. So for example, you know, we might occasionally drop legitimate sessions. The reason we would do that is because it allows us to effect more effectively uh, manage huge volumes of DDoS traffic and ensure availability of that service, even if occasionally someone has to reload a session or something. So there's, there's all kinds of ways where, where that affects your thinking. And so really, what is a DDoS attack? It's a chance, it's, it's an attempt to consume resources, exploit weaknesses in the network, uh, consume whatever the bottleneck resource is that's allowing people to access that service, whether it's bandwidth on a link or CPU cycles on the server or anything in between. So it's really about making a service unavailable. It's targeting the availability of the service. Typically, there's collateral damage because if you're having a DDoS attack big enough to make one service unavailable, all the other services that share that bottleneck resource, whatever it is, are also being made unavailable. And so often, you know, sometimes the best response to a DDoS attack is to simply start dropping all traffic to the target of the attack. So you're effectively completing the attack for the attacker at that point, but you're saving the collateral damage for everybody else. So that's, uh, you know, one of the trade-offs we, we sometimes have to make. Uh, so availability is really hard. You know, trying to maintain availability in the face of massive volumes of traffic far above the design parameters of the network is a big challenge. Um, so in practice, a lot of this falls down as much to technology and algorithms and the technical capability of your solution. It's partly that, but it's as much on the operational side and the operational practices and processes you have around that. There's a lot of cases where you've seen in the news outages due to a DDoS attack and really, it wasn't the DDoS attack that caused the outage. It was the operational practices and responses of that organization to the attack. Uh, you know, we've had many cases where someone came under attack. The only way they could block the attack was by installing ACLs on the edge routers or and doing a flow spec announcement. But they did not have an operational procedure in place that allowed them to do that. Uh, we've had other cases where, where people were under attack. They had spare DDoS capacity sitting in their network unused that could deal with that attack because they had not yet put in place the operational capability to route traffic to those boxes, or in one case, even plug them into the network. So it's as much about the operation side as it is about the technology side to, to solve this problem. So this is our, what we call our ideal architecture for solving DDoS, and it's a multi-layered architecture. So we believe that multi-layered defense is the best strategy. And there's really two primary layers here. The first is inline defense. This sits at the edge of the data center, the edge of the customer network. So you can think of this as the enterprise level component of DDoS defense. Because it's inline, you can get application level visibility. You can have real time views of exactly what's coming into the network at all times. And so you can detect things that you might miss by, by NetFlow. Although by and large, NetFlow in practice catches almost everything anyway. Um, and you can immediately start blocking it when you see it. 
So the idea is immediate availability. Now, this is going to be limited in its capability because what is it? It's a bottleneck. It's sitting on this inbound link. If this is sitting on a one gig link and the one gig link is full, it doesn't matter how good this box is, it's not going to keep you online, it's not going to keep you available. That's where there has to be a cloud component. Something upstream of where the bottleneck is that can deal with that attack. Uh, we have something we call cloud signaling to deal with this, and there is actually an IETF working group that we're participating in right now called DOTS, uh, D-O-T-S, which is coming up with a standard for this type of cloud signaling that could be interoperable across vendors. We're, right now there isn't one, and so we've invented our own that we use in our products, but certainly others, others may have their own versions of this as well. <clears throat> but it's the notion of calling for help when you need it. Now that cloud infrastructure, that scrubbing center that we were talking about, can come into play and help block the traffic at a much higher volume with a much higher capacity upstream of where the bottleneck is. And if that is overwhelmed because the pairing link of that ISP is full, well, then you cloud signal again, and now you're talking about the internet. You just keep going back, hop by hop, until you get past the bottleneck resource that's being exhausted. Because you can't block a DDoS attack if you're downstream of the bottleneck. You have to be upstream of it at the end of the day. And then the other direction, you have threat intelligence coming down from the cloud, at least in our model. <clears throat> the latest intelligence about what are the DDoS attacks? What does a defense device need to know in order to effectively protect against those? Now, sometimes that's just a new software release that has new features, but sometimes it's really just a, a, a feed or some type of uh, information about uh, you know, payload information to look for or session information to look for or likely sources of attack that can provide a more effective defense. And so that closes the loop and provides intelligence to have up-to-date protections when you're in this inline uh, perimeter defense. So that's essentially the solution that we sell, but that's what we view it even in general terms. You notice I've removed all of our product names from this slide. You know, I think any complete DDoS solution must end up looking like this or it is not going to be a complete solution. It's going to be vulnerable to attacks in one way or another. And in fact, uh, in cases like this where you have a really strong cloud defense service running in the ISP, we've seen cases where, for example, large banks come under massive attack, 100 gig attack. Their ISP is taking out 95% of the attack. That's a pretty good response to a DDoS attack. Your ISP is cleaning 95% of it for you. However, what that means is you've still got five gigs coming into your network trying to hit you that the ISP wasn't able to handle. And that's where you need this last line of defense that can be tuned and, uh, you know, in real time for exactly what the network is doing and what it needs to do to protect itself and catch that last remaining 5% that otherwise would still take down the network even though you're catching 95% of it upstream. So that's where the multi-layer defense really, really comes into play. And so the way this looks like in the ISP, we talked about the inline defense. Now let's talk about the scrubbing center. Um, so you have an attack that comes in somewhere. We have our monitoring infrastructure, typically, again, using NetFlow, that's going to detect that, figure out there's an attack going on. You know, if the flow doesn't detect it, there are other ways to detect it. Uh, maybe it's uh, your uh, network monitoring infrastructure detects a, a full link or a router that's gone down, more often a firewall that has gone down and is no longer responsive. Or in the worst case, you get a phone call from an angry customer that says, I can't reach the internet. That happens too. So then what happens is we do the detection, we figure out the attacks going on, and we can analyze it and figure out, you know, what does this attack look like? How is it, what's the components of the traffic? What do we do with it? We're then going to activate the defenses by in our case, usually, sending a route announcement to the routers. We're now telling the network, hey, the target of this attack actually lives behind the scrubbing center, so send the traffic over there. The good thing about this approach is, the rest of the time, none of the scrubbing infrastructure is actually in the path of traffic, so there's no additional overhead on normal traffic at peacetime. So we divert the target's traffic, and then that traffic, good and bad, now starts going through the scrubbing infrastructure which then identifies and filters the malicious traffic and re-injects the good traffic. And there's a whole, I could spend an hour talking about all the operational issues with how to make this work in a complex network. We don't really have the time, but you know, the good news is it's getting easier and easier. It used to be GRE tunnels. Those are really fragile. Now with MPLS networks, a lot of the big ISPs have gone MPLS in their backbone. There's all kinds of easier ways to do this. But um, anyway, it's, that's a whole engineering problem in and of itself. And so when inside the scrubbing center, what do we do? Well, we have different layers of filters, different layers of what we call countermeasures to deal with the attacks. There are different static filters. You know, we know 
these packets are just invalid. They don't follow the, the spec or the RFC, so we're going to throw them out. Uh, there are baselines that we can enforce. We know traffic is supposed to look like this. Let's try to make it look like that. That might degrade the service for some users because we're essentially, it's, it's a very coarse-grained approach, but the service is available, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, we might provide other types of screening. There's anti-spoofing mechanisms, so you authenticate sessions, make sure it's not a spoof traffic. You uh, do botnet or other layer seven protections where we're looking for, say, HTTP headers that are signatures of botnet activity. And each step in this chain filters the traffic until hopefully what's left is, is the good stuff. Uh, and so this is the multi-layered approach to, to taking care of DDoS. Other best practices, right? You can still defeat DDoS even if you've never bought anything from Arbor, although I think you'll be in a much worse shape if you haven't. But uh, FlowSpec is number one. FlowSpec's been a long, a long time coming, frankly. Uh, Juniper has supported it for years. Um, even there, it was a bit of a rocky start. The first uh, ISP I know about that turned it on crashed their entire backbone and had a two-hour outage. But that was the beta. You know, it, it works very well now. It's very robust. The main thing holding it back was that Cisco didn't support it yet. But as of last year, Cisco now supports FlowSpec and did a great job of interoperability testing. So FlowSpec is now a really viable uh, network alternative. And for those that you don't know, FlowSpec is simply a way to use BGP to announce filters to the network. Um, the nice thing about that is it's very easy to manage. You're not logging into each router and reconfiguring it to install ACLs. You can manage it centrally and very dynamically and block attacks. And a lot of attacks can be very easily handled that way. Uh, there's BGP black hole. So I mentioned, you know, drop everything to the target. Bad for the target, good for everybody else. Uh, because you no longer have that collateral damage, although you are completing the DDoS attack, as, as my, uh, Danny McPherson from VeriSign uh, now likes to say. Another way is uh, best practice is BGB black hole plus SRTBH, which is uh, source remote trigger black holing. So if you have uh, unreachable, if you announce black hole routes uh, for the source IPs and you have your routers configured properly, um, even though it's a standard BGP route, like you couldn't use FlowSpec yet, you can still end up dropping traffic from the sources don't really have time to go into it more in depth. Um, and then permanent ACLs to make sense. So for, can make sense in, in certain cases. So if I'm protecting web servers, you'd be amazed how many DDoS attacks just try flooding UDP port 80, and it gets through because the firewall is configured to allow port 80 through, and they didn't specify TCP only. Right? So there's little things like that where you want to just have good best practices of filtering traffic that you should just never have coming in. Uh, and, and those help a lot of the times too. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour through DDoS best practices and operational networks. Uh, now I'm going to get into more of our research and the security report, uh, trying to cram a lot into an hour here. But maybe I'll pause for a minute and just see if there are any questions or uh, anyone had based on, on the first half of the talk while I take a drink. Yes, in the back. Uh, question on the, so you obviously are at a privileged point in the network. Uh, what do you do to secure your scrubbing and monitoring devices, and do you see attacks against those? Well, that's a good question. Um, so a couple of things. I mean, your biggest concern there is not so much DDoS as advanced threat type intrusions, and so we use all the standard best practices there. Don't have those devices be reachable except by internal management IPs within the backbone, uh, which is the same as same security practices they put around a router, right? So we want you to do everything you do for a router, from a security standpoint, you should do for us. All of the sessions are encrypted. You know, it's SSH for shell. It's HTTPS if you're looking at the GUI. Um, so, you know, pretty standard application practices, but uh, but they're fairly effective. And uh, we haven't really ever had issues with that, in, except in cases where someone left a box wide open and and didn't have good passwords on it. Right. So, you know, same same vulnerabilities you would have with any type of any type of device deployed in a network. Yes. Yes. I have a question. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, sort of what's the logic inside the scrubbing boxes themselves? Like, for mm -hmm. example, would you treat like a SYNFLA different from an amplification <coughs> versus NTP versus GNS? Or is it just like <coughs> generic uh, in terms of like looking at the header or you do something deeper and so on? Okay. okay, good question. So in terms of what we do, I'm going to go back a few slides then. Oop. Let me get the animation all the way through. So we have a number of different checks, and we think of it as connection-oriented versus packet-oriented. So there are obviously checks you're going to do on a packet-by-packet -packet basis. Uh, you know, this packet has an invalid combination of TCP flags. Throw it out. You may as how many of those you see. Uh, you know, there may be other things that you don't do all the time, but you can configure. Um, you know, all of the packets in this attack have the exact same TCP segment size. 
that's really unusual, so we'll block packets with that segment size. Uh, you know, things like that can help. So those are packet by packet protocol checks. Some of them we do all the time. Some of them are configurable. And then we have more connection-oriented or, or more aggregate level measurements. Uh, you know, some of the simple ones that pretty much every DDoS vendor on the planet has are, are for rate-based attacks. How much traffic are we seeing from each source IP? Uh, typically, there will be a binomial distribution there where you've got all the legitimate users down on one end and all the attackers at a much higher level. So we set a threshold somewhere in the middle and just start blocking everyone at a higher level. That worked great until CDNs came along, and now a lot of traffic goes through proxies that are mirroring many, many sessions at once, and then it kind of falls down. But it can still be effective depending on where you are. Um, so we have a lot of those kinds of checks, just measuring rates and volumes of various things of interest, uh, number of TCP connections opened those sorts of things. Then you get to authentication. So, you know, if you're under a, sp a SIN flood, a spoof SIN flood at least, uh, you know, we want to authenticate every SIN session. So we don't pass the SINs through. Instead, we respond. The simplest way to do that is with a reset and see if the same client tries to open a new connection. That's easy to spoof as well. There's other ways to play with the TCP protocol around that by sending things like out-of-sequence ACK messages and other things like that. And if you look, there are patents on these. Um, that's actually still a, a very difficult problem that's not entirely solved because in spite of doing that, it can have a high false positive rate, which is very frustrating to us. Um, you know, sending an out-of-sequence ACK or SYNAC is allowed by the TCP RFC and it works perfectly with all the clients, but there are firewalls in the middle that will drop that traffic because they're being overly cautious about what to, what to pass through. And then we can no longer authenticate sessions and protect the, the end site. So that's still a bit of a, if anyone's looking for a good research problem, that's a good security research problem right there. So, um, other things than application level, uh, you know, we're looking at HTTP payloads for invalid headers. Uh, authenticating HTTP sessions in the same way. So send a 302 redirect and see if they follow it. All kinds of, of tricks there um, to get to some of the more sophisticated sessions. Um, things like slow loris. You know, look at each byte as it comes in. If we're detecting a, you know, a lower than a certain threshold of bytes transmitted over a window of time, that's probably a slow loris or other slow, slow type attack. So we're going to drop that session, send a reset to the server to clean up the state and block that sender from future connection attempts. So it's really a whole spectrum of things. There isn't any one thing that you do. It depends on the nature of the attack, and many attacks have multiple uh, components. And in fact, some of them do all of those things at the same time, which makes them pr particularly tricky. So. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, one more in the back. Do you have any way to dynamically scale your infrastructure depending on the size of the attack, or are you just over-provision hoping that your infrastructure is enough? That's a great question. So typically today it's over-provisioning. Most people provision for the volume of traffic that can come into their network, because there's no point provisioning above that. Uh, but they provision to be able to handle that much traffic, assuming that they can drop the DDoS attack internally. Um, obviously, that can be expensive. In terms of dynamic provisioning, uh, you know, we're moving in that direction with things like NFV. Uh, we do have virtual options available for our protection. The problem is just efficiency. Our uh, most efficient box today, which is basically a standard Intel uh, cloud server um, can handle 160 gigs of traffic in 2U just using standard Intel servers running on bare metal. If we set that up as a VM instance and tried to run virtual instances on there, we would get about a tenth of that throughput. So scaling up via virtual works theoretically today, but the practice is not there yet because the hypervisors can't throw packets in and out of the virtual servers fast enough. And I think that's going to be a problem that's going to be solved in the next few years, but it's not solved today, and at least in a broad way. There are ways to do it, but it's tricky and typically involves giving direct network hardware access to each virtual instance, which kind of defeats the purpose of managing it dynamically. Um, so, so that's typically today it's over-provisioning, mainly because the NFV-type technologies are not mature to the point where we can uh, provision dynamically like that. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on, but we can certainly come back and talk more later. I want to make sure we have time to go through some of our data here. Um, so this is our Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report. So this is really based on a survey, although we do augment it with our own data that we get from our deployed systems. Um, so a large uh, segment of service providers, but also large enterprises, government, educational. Um, we have, this report is available, so you guys can, can definitely get copies of it. Um, this, we're just picking and choosing here. It's a 130-page report. Tons, filled with data end to end, so it's good stuff to, to kind of wade through. Um, but it's, again, it's a broad, broad survey. Um, so some highlights from this survey. So uh, response times are improving. People are getting quicker about responding to attacks. That's often been a problem, but uh, you know, there's still room for, for improvement. 
Advanced threats are really the main concern for enterprises now. DDoS has been a problem for a long time. Advanced threats are now more front of mind, but that said, DDoS is not entirely a solved problem for everyone yet either. Um, our largest reported DDoS attack is now at 500 gigs, and as you'll see in a minute, that's a huge increase from what was reported last year. Uh, now, that's what's reported. We certainly see uh, attacks bigger, as big or bigger than that um, in, in, over the last few years anyway, but uh, you know, this is based on what people are actually acknowledging publicly or to us. Um, application layer attacks are, are increasing. Uh, so in spite of what you see in the news, which is this prevalence of reflection amplification attacks, NTP, SSDP, DNS, which are quite effective, um, you hear about those a lot and it makes you think, oh, that's the main way people attack. Well, no, actually more than half of the respondents are still seeing application layer attacks either in conjunction with or sometimes as the sole means of attack uh, compared to the reflection amplification. So that's still an important piece of the DDoS puzzle. Um, existing infrastructure, again, continue to be targeted. It's still the case, 15 years later, that the single most effective way to take out a network is to target the firewall. It's sad, but it's true. Most people should really just get rid of their firewalls. They're not doing anything useful, but that's a, a somewhat controversial position to say. But the firewall is your single biggest network vulnerability. Fact. Uh, and IDS is even worse, but all right, we don't have to go there. <laughs> so, um, I love stirring up the room. Uh, and data center operators do continue to struggle with the large volumes of attacks. The reflection amplification attacks really are growing faster than people are provisioning around them. So here's what the growth looked like. We had a bit of a flat period or even a down period about five years ago. Not sure what happened there, but again, it can be a little weird because it's what people are reporting in the survey. Um, but you can see the last three years, just these massive jumps, and that's where these huge reflection amplification attacks come in. Um, so, uh, you know, very, very big increase. Um, and over half of the EGE, which is an abbreviation that stands for Education, Government, and Enterprise, so basically everyone who's not an ISP, uh, saw attacks that completely saturated their connectivity to the internet. So at that point, you're done, right? If your inbound pipes are full, there is nothing, nothing you can do, but you need your ISP upstream to do something about it. That's where the ISPs come into play. Uh, the complexity of DDoS attacks is increasing. Uh, one note here, so when you see percentages in these results, these are not percentages of attacks. These are percentages of respondents that acknowledge seeing this problem. So a bit of a different interpretation of the data. If you're thinking of this as percentages of attacks, you're going to have the wrong interpretation. So uh, more than 60% uh, still saw the uh, volumetric attacks. I'm sorry, the legend's a little small there. 18% uh, state exhaustion and 18% application layer. Um, these are the attack types. And then multi-vector, 50% saw multi-vector. Is that 50? 56. So again, it's not just about the reflection, it's the multi-vector. Uh, biggest, most prominent example in recent years, a year ago, Sony. The, when North, Car Car uh, North Carolina, North Korea uh, attacked Sony. Well, that's not officially acknowledged, but of course everyone thinks that's who did it. Uh, you know, the, the intrusion to steal the data and hack their servers was done under the cover of a massive DDoS attack. If they had not done the DDoS attack, the intrusion attacks probably would have tripped sensors gotten a much faster, stronger response, and they may not have been successful. But because everyone was running around scrambling to deal with these DDoS attacks that had just completely taken them offline, the advanced threat attacks got in under the radar completely unnoticed until the damage was done. Very, very, very common. DNS is now the top application layer target, which finally overtaking HTTP, although they're both still very significant. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of attacks on DNS, just anecdotally I can tell you, uh, so we protect the largest DNS hosting providers on the planet. Uh, some of the largest, not all of them. Uh, but uh, typically, you know, I will say that they have a common phenomenon, which is some of them, especially ones that host uh, DNS content for, I will say, a particular country. I don't want to name them. Um, see, from 9 to 5 during that country's working day time, uh, nonstop attacks. They start at 9 when the people come into work in the morning. They evolve over the course of the day. As soon as they block one within five minutes, it's changed slightly and changed slightly again until it works, and they're offline again until they block it again. And then at 5 o'clock, it all stops when the people go home. So it's a definite, concerted, state-sponsored, official effort to make sure that content that that country objects to in these servers is not available for people to see. Uh, and it's, it's just fascinating to watch. Uh, and they are getting to the point where, um, where they have very sophisticated and very large botnets to the point where it's, in terms of a traffic volume perspective, 
they have enough bots that each bot can send at a volume of traffic very similar to a legitimate user, and that makes it even harder to distinguish uh, and block some of these attacks. Those are some of the most effective attacks mimicking real user behavior that, that we've seen. Uh, protocols used for reflection amplification. It's funny, it's kind of fashionable. You know, the, it starts out, it started out as NTP and then someone discovered SSDP was wide open in a lot of places, so they moved to that and then everyone saw that was working, so everyone moved to that. Now we're back to DNS again, because uh, DNS is still just the best, I guess, or most effective, I don't know. But, but everyone's back to using DNS uh, primarily, but still, I mean, it's 84% versus 77% saw DNS versus NTP, so it's not like the other ones have gone away. Um, and again, this is largely through lack of best practices, right? It is not best practice to leave your NTP server wide open for anyone to make a request to, but enough people do. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if everyone engaged in the best practices, we would probably no longer be in business, although the world and the internet would be a lot more secure. Uh, here's how that's changed over time. So you can see even just over the last year, here's SSDP peaking and then dropping around May, while DNS kind of crept up and starting around August peaked again as high as SSDP, SSDP ever, what, ever had. Um, so these are, these are the volumes of attacks. This is coming from our internal data, not from the, uh, the survey. Um, but that's, that's what we're seeing, at least, in terms of the kinds of these large, uh, you know, brute force reflection amplification attacks. Who are the targets? Uh, so typically, the 63%, the target is going to be, uh, again, this is respondents seeing attacks too, not percentage of attacks, to be clear, because otherwise these are not going to add up to 100%. Um, but uh, end user, still the most common target. Another anecdote, uh, one of the large online gaming providers that we work with, uh, you know, in a given day, they could have uh, literally millions of games in all of Europe, and as many as 1% of those games can be DDoSed. And they're just being DDoSed by another player in the game. Someone loses or someone says something, gets mad, well, fine, I'm going to kill you and kill the game and just, you know, launches a DDoS attack, probably from only his home network, but it's still enough to take out that game. Uh, so, you know, end users are still the, the primary sufferers here, but followed closely by financial services. Obviously, the banks are a big attack. The most public example of that was Operation Ababil, which was attributed to Iran, although I don't think it was ever proven. Uh, that was in the late... 2012, I want to say, uh, but you can Google it, A-B-I-L. -A -A and uh, that was very interesting. Affected a lot of U.S. banks. Um, hosting services, obviously, because if you're hosting stuff, some of the stuff you host, someone's not going to like. They're going to DDoS it. Uh, government, net, you know, makes sense. E-commerce, still very popular. Uh, you know, people love to try to take down the e-commerce sites for bragging rights and, and maliciousness or extortion. Very common for extortion. And so, and then online gaming, education, and so on. So, you know, everybody is a target sooner or later, but, uh, you know, this gives you a flavor of kind of the most commonly targeted things. Um, attack frequency. Um, so interestingly, 44% of our respondents for, who are service providers now see more than 21 attacks a month. So that's up from 38% last year. So, you know, still an effective jump. 28% uh, of the EGE indicated they had more than 10 attacks per month. So attacks are common. You know, it used to be that, you know, someone would get a major attack maybe once a month they'd have to deal with. Now it's, you know, every day or a couple a week. It's really just much, much more common. DDoS attacks are happening all of the time. I mean, every day there's literally thousands of DDoS attacks happening around the world. They are that common. And the reason why you don't hear about most of them is, is companies like us that are actually successfully defeating a lot of those. But it's just become part of the background noise of the Internet. And, and it's just, it's shockingly common if you aren't exposed to it. Um, and 9% of data operators seeing more than 50 attacks a month. There were none seeing that many last year. So the, just the sheer frequency of attack is increasing, which is it's pretty amazing. Um, attack motivations, this is always interesting. So the, the number one motivation, criminals demonstrating DDoS attack capabilities, 42%. So this is a lot of your extortions, uh, the DD4BC and, and the Armada group, which uh, you guys, some of you guys at CMU have written about. Uh, very, very common now. Um, don't pay if you're ever targeted. They won't go away if you pay. They'll just come back and ask for more. I can tell you. <laughs> That's what they do. But you do need to find a way to defend yourself if they target you. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, well, we may not have that much time, but I'll try to get into a bit of the, the DD4BC stuff. Uh, online gaming related, again, what I was just saying, you know, people who play a lot of online games sometimes don't have the, the best emotional maturity, I'll say, and, and they have the technical know-how to do at least small-scale DDoS attacks, and they're willing to when they get mad. 
So uh, that happens an awful lot. Criminal extortion, so that's actually, yeah, which often gets tied to the other one because they're demonstrating and then they actually do the extortion. Online gambling, uh, you know, over the years, online gambling has been a huge target for DDoS attacks uh, because it's, People know there's money there. Uh, it's easy to extort them because they know downtime equals money for those guys, and they tend to be smaller operators that don't have the sophistication of network response like, a, say, a large online retailer might. Plus, they're more on the fringes of kind of legitimate activity anyway, so you know, it's a little easier. Um, social networking, you know, vandalism, other things. Uh, you know, again, I encourage you, if you're interested, to get the report and, and really go dig into the data. It's hard to, to do it justice, and, and reading numbers in a talk is, is the most boring kind of talk I can imagine. So, um, When it comes to business impact, 64% um, of survey respondents said the operational expense of dealing with attacks is, 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 is a big piece of, of their business impact. So the cost of the security infrastructure, the cost of the people you need to operate it and, and monitor it, um, the impact of the additional bandwidth you need to buy. I can tell you one, one of the large computer companies uh, buys three times as much bandwidth as they actually need to run their, and host their own services just so they can absorb the massive DDoS attacks that they regularly see. So that's a huge operational expense. And they, you know, sometimes it's easier to over provision around a problem. Um, one third of data center operators see revenue loss because again, downtime is money for pretty much anybody who's on the internet. Um, also reputation damage uh, and revenue loss, uh, the next two. So you know, reputation damage, if you're a, a large online business, especially if you're a bank or if you're a data center operator, uh, your brand is your quality of service and your uptime. So seeing that go down, huge impact. Uh, over half of the respondents had firewall or IPS devices fail and contribute to an outage during DDoS attack. Again, like I was saying, get rid of your firewall. If you have a public-facing server, there's no reason to have a firewall in front of it, and you'll have a lot fewer problems. Okay. Um, so revenue loss again and, and customer uh, uh, reputation impact as well. Um, DNS services, um, so 50% of their survey respondents, um, who, who's responsible for dealing with the attacks? That's the other thing that can vary widely. Uh, you know, some organizations have a dedicated security team, some don't, and network engineers kind of run all of it. Um, it, it really varies widely. Uh, so, but 50% of uh, survey respondents said that they have a primary security group that owns this, but that's only 50%, right? So 50% of the people answering the survey don't have a security team who primarily responsible for dealing with protecting DNS or protecting from DDoS attacks. 28% have a special security group for DNS, so okay, that's, that's good, you know, they're actually getting even more specialized. 22% have no security group responsible for DNS. 22%! No security group protecting their DNS servers. That is incredible to me in this day and age, but there you go. Um, so, uh, and then how many have seen uh, infrastructure DDoS attacks against their DNS? 56%. Uh, what is that? No, 30%. Actually, sorry, I don't know what that's saying. These just came out last week, so I'm not up on all of the data. Um, but there are, the good news is that people are increasing their resources for DNS security. 70% of service providers, 26% of enterprises still have no dedicated resources. Scary, but the rest are starting to budget for it and increase uh, the resources for it. Organizational security. How many people are engaging in security best practices? Again, this is what it really boils down to. Uh, authentication for BGP and IGPs. So 70 73% are doing that. That's, that's great. We need everybody to do that, right? I've, I've often been surprised, and there have been some examples of this now, but uh, you know, DDoS attacks seem to be the main way people try to take other people off the internet, which always surprised me because it seems like the easy way to do it is to make one BGP announcement and take someone off the internet. And we haven't seen a lot of that. We have seen a few cases of it. Uh, you know, there was the case uh, last year where Pakistan grabbed all of, I think it was YouTube's traffic for a little while. That was fun. Um, there was another case where all of the traffic for Ukraine was being routed through Russia. That was an interesting one. But, you know, this stuff by definition is public. It's in the routing table. And Ars Technica usually does a good job of writing them up when they see it. Um, but those are, those are fun ones. So beach bee hijacking is still a thing, is still an issue that you have to worry about. Um, but, and, and by the way, if you like reading science fiction, which, which I do, um, Charles Strauss wrote a great book called Halting State, premised around this very thing. So there's, there's actually a really good science fiction novel premised around beach bee routing authentication. So check it out. Mainstream science fiction book. Very cool stuff. It starts with a bank robbery inside an MMO. So, you know, it just gets better from there. Although it's written in the second person, which is a little weird. Um, separate out of band management network, also very important. You know, if you're under DDoS and the only way to reach your security infrastructure to deal with the DDoS attack is over the same links that are being DDoSed, 
not good. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to protect yourself. So having a separate out-of-band management network for your infrastructure is critical. And it's amazing how many times people forget that. So 59% do that. Ackles at network edges, we talked about this earlier, 59% are doing that, you know. Block UDP port 80. No reason it should be on your network. Why let people come in with that? Uh, if you're not running SSDP services, block SSDP. Then you don't have the, the SSDP attacks coming in. Uh, don't let NTP traffic, uh, you know, go where it's not supposed to, uh, from places it's not supposed to be coming from, and so on. Um, other uh, anti-spoofing, you know, URPF, all that kind of stuff. A lot of people still don't do it. More are, which is good, and that's really helped against the spoofed attacks. But we need more people to do it. So best practices are still, you know, really important, and it's easy to think, oh, that's a solved problem, except that a lot of people still aren't doing it. So yes, we know what to do, but it doesn't do any good if people don't actually do it. Okay, so we're running out of time, but I'll try to just dip into our campaign deep dive here. I think that uh, there might be uh, some interest here, and I know, I know folks here have written about it as well. And this is uh, going to be talking about uh, the DD4BC, the DDoS for Bitcoin campaign, or, uh, you know, as uh, we call it, your Bitcoins or your site. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting way to just get into the minds of the hackers. So this was, there, there have been DDoS extortion for a long time, uh, since the 1990s even, and they typically targeted fringe, you know, gambling, adult entertainment, those sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, it has grown over the years. Um, ISPs uh, sometimes have gotten roped in, especially in maybe, uh, you know, emerging economies uh, where, you know, it's easier to go along than to try to protect your customer and risk your business. Um, so a few ISPs have even, you know, joined forces with the attackers in, in order to improve their revenue by charging for the protection or just charging for the traffic. You know, early days of Arbor, it was very common to get DDoS attacked and then you're being billed by the gigabit and you get billed for all that attack traffic because who's going to say it was an attack? So that's largely changed, but that still can be an issue. So what is DD4BC? This is some threat actor or organization uh, that is using this as an extortion mechanism. So, you know, kind of currently now this, now they have been arrested, which I'll talk about. So, or at least some of them have been. So, uh, you know, this is really written about from about a year ago when this was still kind of more active, but very notorious and very, very public, uh, uh, you know, common uh, DDoS extortion campaign. So how did it start? Um, so it first emerged in July 2014. Uh, they debuted with a DDoS extortion attempt against Bitcoin lotto sites, and apparently, yes, that is a thing. Uh, they attacked uh, those in a sports betting house about a week later. Um, the second instance was the first verified uh, time a victim paid, uh, but then uh, they basically did that to buy time until they could get defenses in place, and then they were able to protect themselves from future attacks. Uh, so again, contrary to claims of one-time payment, they, once someone paid, they kept hitting them again every week until they, until they basically could defend against the attacks and then they went away. So it makes sense, right? I'll keep making you pay as long as you're willing to pay and, 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 or you're going to be offline until you can protect yourself. <clears throat> uh, since we're short on time, I'm going to kind of skip over some of this that's not as essential. Um, the attacks generally last a few hours up to 12 hours, and again, if, once you can beat it, once you're... Once they can't take you down, they will go away and focus on weaker prey. So the, really the, the idea is protect yourself, be able to protect yourself, and then you won't have, have these problems. Here's, a, here's an example of a typical extortion email. Uh, Hello, your site is extremely vulnerable to DDoS attacks. Um, blah, 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 blah. By the way, uh, I stopped the attack temporarily, but if I don't get paid in, within six hours, I'm going to restart the attack and double the price. Typical extortionate behavior. Um, so the first attack targets with a mixture of these reflection attacks, NTP, SSDP, and DNS, and so on, as well as some sin flooding mixed in for good measure. Um, but as time progressed, SSDP became the, the means of choice with some of the occasional sin floods. Um, once you defend against one vector, they'll change it and see if another one still works. So you really have to be able to defend against all the different vectors in order to protect yourself because they will change it. And there's no automated system that can be as smart as a human attacker on the other end that can constantly tweak the nature of the attack to get around whatever protections you're putting in place. Uh, so it appeals, uh, so they've kind of centralized on using uh, commercial uh, booter or stressor services. So this is interesting. This isn't some master hacker that's infected a million PCs around the internet and has this massive botnet at their disposal. DDoS is actually a commercial business now. You can go and for 20 bucks an hour per gig, hire 
someone who has a botnet to do a DDoS uh, attack for you. And there are whole online marketplaces where people can go and do this. Uh, they're very professional. I, I should have grabbed a screenshot of those. I didn't uh, do that um, on my way here. But uh, you know, they have, they have a customer service line with technical support so that when you're carrying out the attack, if there's a problem, you can get support for it. Uh, you know, they have robust payment processing. They have maintenance plans where you can get upgrades over time. I mean, it's, it, is, it looks like a full-blown software uh, business, but it's selling either, either uh, malicious software, malware uh, drop sites, or uh, DDoS attacks. And there are these online booter stressor sites which say they're for legitimate use for people to stress and test their own networks or you know, uh, an, an a customer who agrees to it. In practice, a lot of these just end up being a commercial DDoS service. Uh, so, you know, here's, here's one example of one of those, you know, guaranteed power. We guarantee 10 to 50 gigabits power per boot using our SSDP method. So we're going to send a 50 gig SSDP reflection attack when you tell us to. We've updated our SSDP amplification list. So we've got all the latest open SSDP resolvers. Uh, hitting extremely hard as always. So, you know, they, they really go for real marketing for some of these things. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, and if you actually go to YouTube and Google, they have video ads on, on, on YouTube sometimes, uh, including some really creepy ones. But uh, So, um, let's see. Uh, so here's a typical example. Uh, so attack goes out, and, and this, because it's a reflection attack, you don't need a lot of bandwidth to do this. You just go to all those open SSDP resolvers, uh, you send some UDP packets to uh, certain ports, 119 bytes with a spoofed source of your target, uh, and uh, send an uh, msearch enumeration SSDP query. So tell me all the services you know about. Well, a very small query can generate a very large response, and that takes out not just the targeted server, but a lot of stuff upstream of that and a lot of the resolvers that are being used as the reflection points. So pretty devastating attack and not that hard to do which is why a lot of people do it. Here's the contents of one of those um, packets. Uh, so you can see, here's the location, kind of suspicious. So these are some of the things we might stick into that intelligence feed we talked about to be able to identify attack traffic. Uh, server, um, interesting, so UPnP, so it's a UPnP device. Uh, X user agent is Red Sonic, so definitely not a web browser. Uh, but something else, and, uh, and then you have some other stuff here. Things that you can use to fingerprint in on and figure out, hey, this is UPnP traffic. B, maybe I just want to block that because I'd rather have my site up than have my users be able to do UPnP to some random place out on the internet. So again, this is where best practices can help prevent these things from affecting you in the first place. Um, so who or what is DD4BC? Well, we, we know now because they, they finally tracked some of them down. They seem to be not uh, U.S. So for example, they sent extortion attempts over the 4th of July weekend to the U.S. sites and didn't get a response, surprisingly. Didn't seem to realize that they weren't going to get a response. Uh, so clearly they're you know, somewhere else in the world and don't really know U.S. Uh, culture, even though they're targeting U.S. businesses. Um, they attack only one target at a time, it appears, so it's probably a small number of people. They really can only do one thing at a time. They're reasonably tech savvy because they're getting payment in Bitcoin. They're carrying out DDoS attacks, but don't appear to be a high level technical expert, which is why they're relying on other services to actually carry out the attacks. Um, they also didn't seem to fully realize that attacking financial institutions as opposed to online gambling sites is going to bring more law enforcement response, uh, which ultimately is what did them in. So, you know, the, at least some of them were arrested uh, last year or early this year um, in Europe. Um, and they're still tracking down some of the other ones, but uh, um, different investigators. And I think they ended up, I forget where they ended up being, Romania and Bosnia-Herzegovina, I think, but some Eastern Europe. Um, so, you know, again, they did get their own. Um, Let's see, so uh, you know, it gets down to the size of the group. Uh, you know, three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. So you know, they have a couple now. I think it's only a matter of time before we see them unravel the whole thing. Although there have been new agents emerging, the Armada Collective, um, again, something CMU has, has written about, a new threat actor with basically the same MO, uh, doing the same thing, uh, but just picking up where DD4BC left off. And, you know, typical security problem, right? It's always an arms race, and when you solve one problem, someone else is going to show up to to either fill that gap or take advantage of some other problem you haven't solved yet. So otherwise, just like that. So that is it. Uh, coming in just three minutes over the hour. So I appreciate you all staying. I hope I haven't made you late for anything. But um, if you have more time, I'd be happy to stay and take questions until they kick me out. All right. well, thank you. <clears throat> So last week we had a talk on uh, crossfire attacks where you uh, don't attack this.
Yeah. That's a great question. So uh, Vyas and I were having this debate over a hangout one day, and I think we're going to go out for a beer tonight and continue it. Um, so I'll be honest, and I want to be careful how I phrase this. Um, Crossfire was a great paper, and it was a great um, theoretical exercise. In practice, what defeats it is this, right? You've always got to have protection above the bottleneck resource that is being exhausted. Um, I can tell you that if the idea is to send realistic looking traffic to take out a target, it takes much less realistic looking traffic to take out a, the server you care about than it does to fill a link. So I can take out any SS, I can take out pretty much any SSL server in the world right now by sending random binary garbage to port 443. And you would be amazed how little it takes if it's a server that does SSL for it to just churn itself to death trying to process and do all the calculations on that random data. Um, same with DNS, right? I can easily send a sm much smaller volume of traffic than it would take to fill a bottleneck link to a DNS server issuing, say, expensive any queries or text queries, and that server is going to be totally exhausted from a CPU standpoint, unable to respond to legitimate requests long before the link fills up. So in operational practice, people are much more concerned about those sorts of things and trying to, to solve that problem than they are about the link being full. If the link is full, um, there's a couple of things you can do. One is, uh, you know, if they're attacking the static IP, which often they do, change DNS and route the traffic to the new IP somewhere else. Problem solved. Um, another thing you can do is some of the other countermeasures I mentioned. So authentication, you know, then it gets down to the specific types of traffic, right? A lot of the attack tools leave a fingerprint in the traffic. Uh, you know, in TCP, we see traffic where they're forging the TCP header because they, it's more efficient to send higher volumes of packets. So we can look at, hey, all these packets look exactly the same in the TCP header. So let's just block all the traffic that have the exact same segment size value that they're using. Um, or it's, it's spoof traffic, so we can authenticate it using HTTP authentication or uh, TCP authentication. And then anyone who's not actually running a real stack uh, will get blocked. So will Google botnet, Google bot search, by the way, which is a problem, but that's, that's another issue. Um, <clears throat> interesting aside, Google seems to, for their search crawler, seems to have written their own TCP stack. So if we send a TCP authentication request to them, like say an out of sequence ACK, the normal response for a client is to immediately send a reset and a new SYN. Google, the Google uh, TCP stack does that, but it does it an hour later because it went onto like a work queue somewhere and then finally got spooled out again. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, as an aside, so TCP authentication, um, if it's DNS, there are cases where it is legitimately very difficult. If it's non-spoof traffic and it mimics legitimate traffic enough so that we can't differentiate it from spoof traffic, then yes, it's a problem. Although again, in that case, you've probably taken out the service you're targeting long before the link fills up. But then you do really need to get in and do the nitty gritty of saying, okay, uh, we need, that's where we really need to develop new algorithms, new technologies to try to automatically analyze and find some fingerprint of difference between the legitimate and the illegitimate traffic. And, uh, you know, so that certainly does happen, uh, but those are definitely the, the small minority of cases because it's so easy to send 200 gigs of SSDP traffic and just take the entire freaking network off the internet, you know, rather than having a carefully crafted uh, attack that's going to be indistinguishable from real traffic. So that's, that's the kind of long answer to that. So not that it's a, a bad attack or anything like that. It's just that in practice, there are other, other problems that maybe we care about a little more. Yes. <clears throat> That is the pain of our lives right now. So encryption is, is just killing everything. And, you know, I, I, I kind of see both sides of it, right? You know, encryption is good for privacy, and I care about privacy. Uh, that said, the, you know, the fact that all your Google searches are encrypted means it's a lot harder to protect really fundamental basic services that you may not care about actually being encrypted. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but that is a huge problem. So, you know, there's still ways to protect against some of the, the layer three, layer four volumetric attacks. That way we can still do the TCP authentication. We can still do other things. Uh, we, do th we do things like SSL handshake uh, because that handshake is pre-encryption. So we can analyze the handshake and say, okay, this guy is trying, to, you know, sending random binary garbage to port 443. Well, let's just not let that through. Um, but then once you actually have a valid session, it's encrypted, 
you got to do decryption somewhere if you're going to look at application layer attacks. And that, that can be a real problem. Um, we have people that will stick some type of DDoS defense mechanism behind the SSL proxy. So they'll have a big SSL proxy load balancer, and then it can decrypt and pass clear traffic to the device. Um, I had one customer call that an SSL mullet, business in the front, party in the back. But, uh, <laughs> and, and most organizations actually don't want to do that for obvious reasons. So then it becomes a real challenge. Either you need, you need to be doing decryption somewhere. So we do offer decryption in, our, in some of our appliances. That does mean you need to have um, either you're creating another proxy or in, the, in the chain of sessions or you're installing your private keys and certificates on another server that can, so it can do the decryption. And there, there no, there's no ideal solution at this point. That's a really largely unsolved problem and it's, it's a very difficult one. Okay, so if I understood your question, you're just looking for how would, if you were designing something from scratch, how would you make it really robust against these types of attacks? Is that essentially? I mean, so first of all, it's the best practices. You know, a lot of these problems are, although unfortunately sometimes that requires other people to follow the best practices too, like in the case of anti-spoofing. Um, so you certainly need um, robust uh, infrastructure. You need enough capacity to be able to absorb attacks. You usually need redundant capacity so that when one link is full, you have somewhere to put the good traffic while you clean it up. Um, you do need, uh, again, both, for, at least in front of the things you really care about. You probably can't do it everywhere, but something in line. This is an easier place to do decryption too, by the way, because decryption needs to really be in line. Um, but uh, also the signaling. So don't assume you're gonna have to do everything yourself. Have a relationship with other providers that you can cooperate with. And a lot of the, the cloud DDoS uh, protection services you know, are, are doing this like VeriSign, like Arbor Cloud, um, even like Akamai's Kona, um, to provide a, a way to handle the attack before it's a, above the bottleneck again. So, you know, I don't know that I could point to any one algorithm that would solve this problem. Unfortunately, this is the inherent tension in having an open interconnected system where anything can legitimately talk to other things. You want to enforce that they're talking in the right ways, but building in more security beyond that starts getting into either the overhead where we no longer have the bandwidth that we enjoy today or uh, issues of privacy or practicality. It's, it's a difficult problem. I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, thanks. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>